sponsored by JMR Rentals. JMRNY.com. Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend. I'm Jason Godby, and today on the program, we're talking Dune, Dune Part 2. And joining me via Zoom, we got uh, two of our favorite movie fans. We got No Rest for the Weekend's own Mary Beth Thewison and our man in Hollywood and the man behind ActuallyPaid.com, Mr. William Hammond. Welcome, guys. Hey, Jason. Good to be here. Hey. We got the Dream Team back. We haven't done this for a minute, the three of us, I think. Um, but, and, you know, normally we do, you know, when we talk, when we review movies, we, you know, we do like a two, three, sometimes a handful, but this was so much movie <laughs> that I wanted to dedicate a whole show to it. Um, and we all saw it. So the first thing I want to know is how you guys saw the film. Mary Beth, where, where, did, where did you see it? Did you just go IMAX, regular screen? I saw it on a regular screen, but it was a large screen. I recommend seeing it on the largest screen you can find. <laughs> and what about you, Bill? I took it in on IMAX, uh, which is a huge contrast because the last one I had to watch on my TV when it when it went to streaming. So the difference is almost literally night and day. It was interesting because I went to Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center had a retrospective of Denis Villeneuve films as well as some that he curated so i ended up seeing blade runner blade runner 2049 and dune part one on the big screen there and mary beth and i had reviewed the first one uh back in 2021 when it came out but then when i saw it again i was like i don't feel like i saw this movie like i don't feel like i even experienced this like i feel like i saw uh a like a facsimile of it kind of thing. I know I didn't feel like I, I saw the, the movie and then I saw the movie on the big screen and I went, Oh my God. About a week later, I think I saw Dune part two and well, Oh my God, that was even more movie than the first movie. So there's a lot of movie to talk about here. Mary Beth, you're the best at summarizing things. Why don't you give us a brief of Dune part one and then tell us uh, a brief of, Dune part two, if you can. Well, I'll try. <laughs> it's all about the spice. Uh, spice is a substance secreted by the giant sandworms on the desert planet Arrakis. It's essential for space travel. It has mind expanding properties for those who are sensitive to it. So it's the most valuable substance in the universe. And as we're told at the beginning of Dune part two, power over spice is power over all. And everybody wants that power. So in the first Dune, the emperor asked Duke Leo Atreides to go to Arrakis to be the governor there and oversee the spice mining operation. So he goes with his significant other, the Bene Gesserit sister, Lady Jessica, and their son, Paul. But this is only a ruse to allow the Harkonnens, the former governors, to eliminate the Atreides once and for all. The Harkonnens attack, Duke Leo is killed, and Paul and Jessica are forced to flee to the desert and they take refuge with the indigenous Arrakis people, the Fremen. So in part two, Paul is learning the ways of the desert from the Fremen people, particularly Chani, who he falls in love with, and Stilgar. And he ends up leading guerrilla attacks against the Harkonnens spice mining operations, the machines and the soldiers who guard them. Meanwhile, Lady Jessica has the opportunity to become a Fremen Reverend Mother. She has to do so by imbibing the toxic water of life, which is also derived from the worms. She survives the experience and becomes a Reverend Mother, but she's pregnant. And that water of life breaches that placental barrier and affects her unborn fetus, who then has the mind of an adult while she's still in utero. <laughs> she and Jessica plot to avenge Duke Leto and to get power for Paul. They use a Fremen prophecy about a Messiah who will come to free the Fremen people from their oppressors, which had been planted by the Bene Gesserit generations ago. In the meanwhile, the Harkonnens are not taking this lying down. They want to get rid of the Fremen attackers. And so they try to prevent it, to attack them and, and prevent it from happening, but they don't have much success against these guerrilla attackers. So the leader of the Harkonnens, the Baron, uh, tasks 
one of his nephews, Fade Ralph, who's the psychotic guy, to take over the job. Meanwhile, Paul is having dreams in which he sees millions of people killed because of actions he takes because of him, because he has accepted this uh, Messiah prophecy. So he is fighting against this fate, but things spiral out of control <laughs> and he, he can't resist it forever. <laughs> you know, uh, the one thing, I'm so glad you wrote the review for us because <laughs> I felt like I was like, this movie, this doesn't need a review. It needs a syllabus. <laughs> like, <laughs> It's it's so much movie. <laughs> what were your first impressions of it? What what did you what was like what was the the thing that knocked you over about it? Well, it's it's just full of spectacle. Um some people I know who watched the first Dune liked it but thought it was a little slow, you know, not much was happening. I said wait till the second one. And sure enough, uh, there uh, like I say in my review, it's just more. A lot of people have used the words epic. Uh, but you've got everything in there. You've got um, more battles, more explosions, more worms, <laughs> uh, more Benny Gesserit, uh, just everything. And it's, it's a, a, the first one was a feast for the eyes and ears. This one, even more so. It's spectacular. Bill, what, what did you think of it? The big thing for me in both films is the sense of scale. Like, you really do feel like you're in another world when you're watching these films. The way Denis Villeneuve and his uh, effects team just construct everything from the tiniest grain of sand to these gigantic war machines and, and sandworms, you always get a sense of where you stand, whether you're you know, doing a silly walk through the desert to avoid the worms or watching that tiny little Muad'Dib kangaroo mouse just flittering about you almost feel like you could reach out and grab a handful of the sand and see the particles of spice melange within it. And it's never done in a way that's too flashy. A lot of the effects are a really great mix of digital and practical, subtle changes with the color palette to, you know, turn their eyes blue when the spice affects them. The The introduction scene for Fade Rautha in this in this washed out gladiator arena where it's all done in black and white but it's not of complete digital effect they really did cake ba uh austin butler in this insane amount of white makeup and a black outfit you know to do the to do these scenes and they i think they shot those in abu dhabi so it was like 130 degrees when they're doing this the first film was very dense it was a lot of table setting there were so many characters to keep track of there's still a little bit of that in this movie but there's a whole lot more cutting to the chase. Like we only have a couple of new characters in this film, Fade Rautha, the emperor, his daughter, that we really need to keep track of. Everybody else we were already established with and we can kind of just watch their journey unfold now. And that that really aids in the immersive, uh, almost interactive process of, of not just seeing this movie, but in experiencing it. They shot most of it in a real desert. You could feel the heat coming off of this, you know, like you really could. I don't know if it was seeing it on the big screen or mainly because you get more into the characters in part two, but I, in the first Dune, I really didn't feel much for the characters. Like I really, like, I really was like, okay, this is a bunch of rich people doing, you know, and then the, my sort of point of contact, uh, my, my point of empathy was the Zendaya character. I felt for her the most and I felt for, because she's trying to do the right thing by her people, but she's also in love with Paul, but you can see that she sees that this is going downhill quick and, you know, there may be nothing left of her planet, of her relationship. I didn't realize, I didn't realize it at first, but I was like, that's the, actually the sympathetic character. That that was one of the major points that, that Villeneuve uh, did in altering the source material and uh, departing from the previous version from the 80s that, that David Lynch did. He made Shawnee into a much more fully realized character with with agency and a perspective of her own r rather than her just being uh, the love interest. I also have to call out the the other two really good performances here, which is Tim Timothy Chalamet as Paul and Rebecca Ferguson as Jessica, because they both 
go much deeper into these characters this time around than last time. Rebecca Ferguson was great last time, but she's even better now. She's so ruthlessly manipulative. Uh, she just lets nothing stand in her way. And Timothy Chalamet, you know, goes to, I, I feel like a deep, darker place than we've ever seen him go before. When And you can tell that the uh, expectations everyone has of him are just wearing on him. Let's talk about some of the themes because... I don't think religion does great for the, in this movie. Um, you know, there's a lot of allegories. I mean, I kept seeing stuff like, of course, the Middle East. That's the biggest one. You know, uh, you know, people have compared spice with oil for forever. It's Afghanistan. It's Vietnam. It's, you know, all of these, what happens when you mess with an indigenous people type warfare. Well, you know, this is one reason I think that Dune continues to be so popular. There was a series of six novels to start with that were written by Frank Herbert. And um, it's because it's not just, you know, space cowboys. It's really weighty, real world stuff that goes on in there. Colonialism and, um, you know, all of its horrible effects, like you just mentioned. And then religion. Boy, in the book's after this, religion is a really big deal. Um, here we see how a religion starts. There's a hero, the hero becomes a legend, and then the legend becomes a god, and a religion starts, and it's out of control. Um, you see the beginnings of that here with this prophecy. Some of the Fremen think that Paul is their foretold Messiah, and they believe in him. Others, like Chani, don't. She's really suspicious of all of this. So, um, yeah, the, the religion comes in for a real dissection. <laughs> she even says, she's like, this prophecy is how they enslave us. It's not subtle, you know, but it's effective. That's another reason why I think I sympathize with her character, because she's in this world where she sees all of these people with this blind belief, especially Javier Bardem's character, who was I, you know, he's a, he doesn't get much to do in the first film. I thought, though I thought he was very good. He gets a lot to do in the second film and man, is he great. He really sells that zealot kind of, and he's not, it, you feel like he's got, there's an innocence to him yeah. in that zealotry too. You don't feel like he's proselytizing he's, to, you know, self-aggrandizing himself or anything yeah. like that. He's, he's not doing it for power. He's doing it because he really believes this will free his people. True believer, yeah. yeah. One of the biggest criticisms I usually have with religious films is that whatever the messianic or fundamentalist or dogmatic angle is, that's taken as read, that's taken as a given, that uh, as an understood truth that you, that you start from, rather than asking the questions and seeing how you can come by these beliefs. This film, on the other hand, does show that there's the very real perceptions of colonialism and manipulation that the Bene Gesserit do, that, that uh, Jessica does, that Chani sees. But you also see someone like Stilgar, who comes by his fanaticism quite honestly. It's like, and there is weirdly a positive result from that because it is a unifying force for the Fremen to get them to unite behind Paul and fight the good fight and basically put their tribal differences aside for the sake of this common goal. I mean, th there's been a lot of memeing of Stilgar's character, you know, th the fact that Paul says he's not, a, he's not a messiah. And then he goes, see, he's too humble to say that. Like it, it's life of Brian almost. It's like, it's like the Messiah, the Messiah says he's not the Messiah. No, he's a very naughty boy. But, but it's like, but but again, you can see how people are led and how some others actively choose this angle, whether it's delusional or not, they choose it because it gives them something to cling to. And that is worthwhile and valuable. I love, as you said, it's not subtle, but it is very nuanced. And I, I'm very appreciative of that as someone who is not religious and has an objection to religious angles in film sometimes. This is the way you're going to do it if you're going to do it. You know, the other thing, uh, speaking of the religious aspect, is the the, the Bene Gesserit mother uh, is uh, Charlotte Rampling. When you first see her, you're like, wow, she's a force to be reckoned with. She has that first scene with Paul, where, you know, put your hand in the box thing, which they also do in the in David Lynch's doing. But it was a really powerful scene. 
but then we get to see her with the emperor's daughter played by florence Pugh, and you're like oh she's evil <laughs> like she's on another level of manipulation these people think in centuries you know not years or decades they are think you know and they're they're thinking generationally about what they're going to do because remember paul was not supposed to be a boy and she was kind of she was kind of miffed about that you're, you're mentioning their breeding program which i mean think about that <laughs> you got like what like eugenics in there yeah. and you know stuff like that like you know th that's that's like nazi level evil i kind of also wonder you know it's it's very it's very machiavellian you know it's very like the power behind the throne the other thing that i that um in terms of the characters was like you every i think everybody pretty much gets to shine and you see everybody's perspective everybody there has different motivations for being there like i was really impressed with the character arc that they gave some of these characters Mm -hmm. Like Paul actually gets a character arc. He's not just a figurehead or like, oh, you know, the because how many times have we seen a movie like the prophesied one or the chosen one? But he actually gets to be conflicted about it and very convincingly, you know, that 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 was it was powerful and it was really well done. One of the things I loved about this uh, is the fact that. Dena Villeneuve, he he's challenging the audience to basically say, Paul is the hero because he's taking the hero's journey, but what about him actually makes him heroic? Between him and the, the Reverend Mother that, that, that Charlotte Rampling plays, we get a very real firsthand lesson in how power corrupts. We get to see it play out almost in real time. And yeah, we root for Paul because he's the underdog, because his family is the one that got targeted. Um, but he does take some actions that may end up being a net positive, but certainly aren't heroic in the moment. Again, a tremendous amount of nuance in the storytelling on this that just absolutely blows me away. And then you get the power of the emperor, played by the almighty Christopher Walken, <laughs> who I was very happy did not go full walk-in in this movie <laughs> yeah. like the last thing like if he had been like i'm the emperor like if he had done like if he had gone full walk-in it would have just taken everybody out of it but um, who is this muadib <laughs> that you speak of we is gotta, Paul Trades somehow alive <laughs> we gotta take down the fremen you know it, it would have been you know i mean talk about memes but like I thought, he, I thought you know, I think people kind of forgot that Christopher Walken can act. You know, he's an Oscar winner. You know, yeah. he, he won an Oscar for uh, Deer Hunter years ago. But he can actually play characters when he's not just doing the Christopher Walken thing. I, I think they use him sparingly and in the right amount. And uh, Florence Pugh also gets some nice moments as well. Uh, besides looking just uh, kind of freaky gorgeous in that headdress thing that they had yeah. her up in, that was that thing was amazing. If, if if I ever go to a convention and someone cosplays that dress properly, I will propose on the spot. I'm just going to put it out there. Well, and let's talk about the real scene stealer here, who is Austin Butler as Fade Rautha. Oh, <laughs> he is so amazing. Fade is charismatic and psychotic as all get out, a casual killer, and... You know, he's he, all all the Harkonnen are pale and bald, but he also has his teeth blacked out. And when he opens his mouth, it's just so freaky. And his performance is way out there. Um, he he performs in these rigged gladiatorial contests on the Harkonnen homeworld, Gady Prime. And um, and. Uh, Bill, you mentioned the stark black and white of those scenes. They actually filmed those in infrared with a special camera. So there's none of the gray tones of regular back, black and white film. It's amazing to watch. And, but then Austin Butler is amazing to watch. And yet they give him a vulnerability. The, the uh, Benny Gesserit kind of go after him as maybe an alternative to Paul. And they've 
they have this whole dossier on him. <laughs> and they say that he is vulnerable around issues, issues of humiliation and pain, you know, and, and you, you see a moment of that and you go, oh, wait, this psychotic guy <laughs> even has his own weaknesses. So all of the characters are really fleshed out. I mean, in fairness, if Leia Seydoux came on to me, I, I'd have a hard time thinking straight uh, as well. But but no, <laughs> I, I absolutely love Austin Butler's performance here. Like in the in, in the first film that David Lynch did, Sting plays Fade Ralpha, and it's a pure camp performance. It's it's there to be so bad it's good, and you just kind of you know mystery science theater love to laugh at it. Here he's a serious character. He's just as nuts. He's just as out there, but there's this weird, committed, insane dignity to him. I remember, like, I had to check myself multiple times because I'm the way Butler plays him, especially when he's, like, walking solitary through the hallways and lowering his head just like this, but looking up. I saw Bill Skarsgård's Pennywise with the hair removed. That's how creepy intense he was. But again, all of it germane to his character to the story as it's presented and with a motivation that he comes by honestly like you said he's vulnerable to humiliation because he's the second fiddle to um to dave bautista's character you know he's the skinnier one he's not as intimidating a presence physically so you you might underestimate him as a strategic threat as a tactician and as a lethal force. So he dedicates himself to proving everyone wrong. I mean, it's massive foreshadowing when he finishes the gladiator battle and, and whispers, you fought well, Atreides, to his last victim. You, you know that's going to come back on him. Even if you don't know the story, that's just, that, that's just basic scripting 101. But you also know that when it comes back, it's actually going to have impact. And again, given the just pure bonkers interpretation that Sting gave 40 years ago, that is immense. I I, I have just loved watching Austin Butler develop as, as an actor. Between this, between Elvis, and as audiences will get to see in June in The Bike Riders, the man is extremely versatile. And, and immersive into those characters. Exactly. I saw him on a talk show and they were talking about, you know, the 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 design of the character and he was wearing this sort of like bald cap with an appliance for his eyebrows because he doesn't have eyebrows either which just makes everybody look weird and i i got some serious i think you know i got some serious like uh slytherin moments from him like a I th I, at one point i thought he spoke parcel tongue <laughs> like he's got like a weird affect to his voice what i also love about him is how he's the polar opposite of paul uh, and that is very much uh, Empire Strikes Back and Star Wars, where all the good guys are like in earth tones and browns and greens and stuff, and all the bad guys are stark black and white. Does anybody know if the next movie is green lit? Do you know if we got? Um... Not officially, but it's going to be, it, it, but it will it be. It will be. Uh, he, uh, Denny Villeneuve is writing the script right now, and apparently it won't be green lit until the script is completed. I don't know anything about. Uh, the next one, I just, uh, this one I thought left in a great place. Uh, I thought we, and I'm really glad they didn't try to make this one movie. Um, my one probably criticism of it is that it's almost too much for one film. You know, like t part two itself is too much. To me, it's almost too much. I, first of all, it's damn near three hours. There was no intermission, <laughs> you know, and I had a large soda. Like, <laughs> It's not <laughs> logistically, it's not great. Uh, but other than that, you, you must see it in a theater, I think. Cause like I said, when I saw the first one, I was like, Oh, this is, you know, this is pretty good. But I had the same complaints. There's a lot of table setting. It's a little bit slow. I feel like I'm reading the cliff notes of a movie kind of thing. And then, you know, but the second one, you're right in the, you know, you get thrown right into the action. I also found with the second one, I don't, I, and I don't know if it's because it was more action oriented, but I was definitely more engaged with the characters. I did not care about the characters in the first movie all that much. I felt like I was, you know, watching this big story unfold and I was certainly appreciating things from a technical perspective, but I don't feel like I 
I didn't feel like I watched a movie kind of thing. I don't feel like I got the story or the the pathos or the catharsis with the cam- with the characters. This time around, I did. It's appropriate that you mention Empire Strikes Back because when I was watching this, I very much got an Empire or Godfather Part Two vibe from it in the sense that this is that rare sequel that arguably outdoes its original in terms of overall quality. And with the high likelihood of a third installment, if there's any one flaw to be had with this movie is, are we going to get Return of the Jedi or are we going to get Godfather 3? That's that's my biggest concern at this point. And that's a testament to how great this film is because if that's the only thing I'm worried about when, when I come out of this thing in two hours and 45 minutes, you've done your job. All right, I think that's a great place to wrap up. This was great, guys. Um, I'm really glad that we took the time to talk about this movie because I feel like it warrants. I feel like we have talked about three movies, essentially. You know, hopefully we'll get part three and we can do this again because, uh, you know, I, I'm really digging these movies. Uh, but uh, so, Mary Beth, we can see, we can read your reviews on no rest of the weekend podcast.com. We, we really appreciate you. Uh, you did a great job on this review. It got uh, really good feedback online. Thanks. And Bill, for people who want to find your stuff, where can they find you online? You can find me at actuallypaid.com, where I have also reviewed this film. It's my first A of the year. And uh, you can find me on YouTube uh, at actually underscore paid. Same thing on the tweets. And uh, I even have my blog repurposed onto Medium. So there's tons of places you can find me, including right freaking here. One last question before we go. A quick poll. First, We're only in the first quarter of the year. Is this the best movie so far of 2024? Yeah. By by a country mile. (laughs) And that's all we got for you today. Thanks so much for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more of our content, including more movie reviews, visit our website, norestfortheweekendpodcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube, youtube.com slash getbehindtherabbit. I'd like to thank Mary Beth Thewison and William Hammond and our sponsor, JMR Rentals. For Behind the Rabbit Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.